What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are picking up with the Immortal Thor. We're actually covering the first two issues of this. Now, issue number one doesn't really have a whole lot going on in it. One of the cool things that does happen here is Loki restores the Bifrost bridge using basically magic because Loki can do that kind of stuff. I mean, if you ever wondered why it is that he didn't restore it earlier, well, because you know, comics. But what Thor ends up doing is he basically travels back to Earth because of his ability to access the Bifrost bridge. Now. This is where things go wild, because as he gets here, and really with his return, he kind of celebrates among humanity, right? He's kind of been like the missing son that the human race hasn't seen for quite some time. And so he kind of spends time among humanity, does his own thing, but then as he's spending the evening standing on the Statue of Liberty, the whole thing is suddenly struck by lightning. Now, what's so crazy about this is that when that happens, this gigantic figure emerges, basically attacking Thor. Now, this guy basically gives us like these huge clues on what's going on with him, right? He says, I come to you from Utgard, the storied land that is the land of true things. I come to shatter thy false world apart. I am Tyrannos or Toranos, whatever you want to call him, the Utgard Thor. Now, people who are very knowledgeable about Marvel comics, when I say very knowledgeable, I mean like have been reading for a couple decades or so, will know what Utgard is, but most of you probably don't. And it is a really, really cool place that never gets talked about. So Thor, of course, responds exactly the way that you would expect him to, right? He basically calls this guy out. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that Thor is a traditional superhero, right? It's what superheroes do. But it's also because Thor has no clue who he's messing with here, because this guy is an elder god. Thor literally summons all this power of the lightning, and it does nothing to this guy, right? It doesn't even harm him in the slightest. It's just kind of whatever, and this guy literally shrugs it off. Now, at that point, we switch over to Gaia. Now, Gaia in all this, and I'll make sense of all this here in a second, because it's really, really cool. It's gonna blow your mind. Gaia ends up meeting with somebody else whom we can't see. And all that happens is this person says, the wheel has turned, the wheel turns. Our brother walks in the world again, and only your son bars the path of his rage, is all as you wished it to be, Sister Gaia. And she responds in saying, little is as I wished it to be, brother, but I would have unlocked what I sealed long millennia ago if there were other options. And this person responds in saying, you well recall the last time we were all abroad, echoes of it ring in dark legend. Some yet use our names as talisman. I recall the amusing Screamier and did not the Thunderer fight a Tyrannos in his past. Now, of course, she responds in saying that was basically a troll who was using the same name, but this guy responds and he says, Thor will be tested by more than trolls now as he was before long ago, when he journeyed to the Utgard Hall in his youth. That's a massive clue. And as before, if he breaks, if he falls, if he fails to be what he must be, it will mark the end of all that is. The rule is clear. All things must live and grow or wither and die. The age of marvels can be no exception. And then they kind of go back and forth for a little bit and we end up finding out that this guy is actually the Utgard Loki. So what in the world is going on with these? Cause this is just the first issue, right? It's so like, what in the world is going on with these guys? Okay. The Elder Gods are ridiculously overpowered. But what's so funny about this is these are new introductions by Al Ewing. We've never seen these guys before. So here's the way all this stuff works, right? Thor and Odin and Loki and those guys, you can kind of refer to them as effectively new gods. The Elder Gods are like, really old school and really overpowered. So in the very early days of Earth, you had what was called the Demiurge, which was basically like uh, Earth's biosphere, right? The essence of life on Earth. And what it did is it spawned all these elder gods. One of these elder gods named Set had realized that if it consumed other elder gods, it could absorb their power. And so the result was that basically every single elder god on Earth just 
descended into absolute madness, attacking each other, killing each other, and consuming their power. Gaia was one of the very few elder gods that did not devolve into this level of degeneracy. What she ended up doing was actually basically getting herself knocked up with an elder god named Atum. What this guy did is he went around and consumed all the elder gods except for like Cthone and Set. Cthone, a lot of you guys know from like the Scarlet Witch mythos, right? The super powerful evil demon that's always trying to take over Scarlet Witch's body and use her as a vector on Earth. This guy took off to the flickering realms. Then you had Set who took off to the Serpent Sea, I'm pretty sure, but they basically live in different dimensions. The bigger point that I'm making here is the power of even people like Odin with the full Odin force is dwarfed by the power of the Elder Gods. These guys are on a whole different level. And that's what Thor figures out incredibly fast, right? Like when he attacks Tyrannos with this lightning bolt, nothing really comes out of it, right? I mean, literally the guy's just kind of standing there and he even makes fun of him, right? Even starts screaming at him, right? Like you would strike me with the storm, puny micro god, the meager lightnings you command are nothing to one such as I. For I am Tyrannos, who was the god of thunder when the thunder first spoke. He says Tyrannos, who holds the wheel of fate in his hand. Now, that's another major clue of what's going on. And this is why Al Ewing in Marvel Comics right now is kind of rewriting everything. So a lot of you guys looking at this person right off the bat will say, he looks familiar. And if you were an old school reader of like the Alpha Flight series back before it started to suck, when Chris Claremont wrote the comic, we were introduced to beings called the ones who sit above in shadow. And these were just crazy powerful guys. It tied into the cycle of Ragnarok, right? Like the idea of like Asgard being destroyed and all the Asgardians dying. It's a cycle, right? Like it happens all the time. They always end up being destroyed by whatever manner and whatever means they're always reborn. But all that life energy of the Asgardians was consumed by those who sit above in shadow. We never really knew what their actual origin was or where they came from. And in fact, during the Loki series, right, the last days of Loki leading up to Secret Wars in 2015, the closest we ever got was like Loki hypothesizing that maybe they were Beyonders, but there was never really any definitive answer. The biggest moment with them came during the events of Thor Ragnarok or Thor Disassembled, when Thor basically destroyed the world tree of Idrisil and was believed to have killed them, only to find out that they weren't actually dead. What seems to be going on here is that Al Ewing is rewriting all this mythos in such a way to effectively say that the ones who sit above in shadow are basically elder gods who were locked away somewhere along the line. We don't definitively know, right? We won't know until Al Ewing basically gives us like the conclusion of all of this and it all basically wraps up. But the bigger point here is that it would make logical sense. The power of the ones who sit above in shadow is way beyond the power of virtually any and all Asgardian gods who exist out there, including Thor and Odin. But what's really crazy about this is that that Thor, in addition to his Thor force, summons the power of Odin, right? The Odin power, i.e. the Odin force. So in effect, his power is more or less amplified several times over. And even then, he's still not able to defeat this guy. And again, he makes fun of him, right? Like the God of ants sends a single spark against me and cannot even hit me with it. Now, this is the thing behind this. Thor's not trying to attack him in the here and now. And this is a testament to the power of the Odin Force and is actually a new development that we'd never really seen before, at least the Thor power and the Odin power combined together. Thor basically rips open what's called the Yawning Void. And the Yawning Void is literally a portal to the far shore, right? The place beyond all time and space, just before you get to the white hot room where the Phoenix Force resides. In effect, Thor is sending this guy to the realm where celestials and really gods of the highest order all go to die. But what's crazy here is we're told it's not gonna kill this guy. It's basically a way to just kind of keep him out of the way for a little while, but he will come back, he will return. The kicker about all this is that as most of you guys know who are familiar with the Thor mythos, specifically with the Odin Force, the Odin Force is a massive source of power, but when you use it, it requires you to rest, right? The all sleep, the Odin sleep, whatever it is that you wanna call it. So while Terranus is basically sucked in 
through the yawning void and literally sent to the far shore where he's effectively yanked away and trapped for what's probably going to end up being like the next issue or maybe a few issues after thor uses what little remnant of the odin force he has left combined with what little energy he has left to kind of fix everything in new york that was destroyed during the fight between the two of them and then promptly begins to pass out now he doesn't completely and totally pass out but this guy's exhausted he's drained of energy right he just can't really go on and so what happens is loki suddenly appears now loki did appear in the first issue of course when he restored the bifrost bridge but loki in recent years in marvel comics has been very enigmatic and marvel has largely been toying with this idea that loki has a much bigger role to play in the marvel universe than we were ever really led to believe right like the god of stories and so on and so forth loki's whole escapades traveling with adam brashear and the defenders to like the varying realms of magic and godly power and fighting the beyonders and so on and so forth but we didn't really know what the deal was with loki and even now we don't fully understand what's so interesting here is that with the exchange between the two of them loki suddenly just pops up and says will you trust me and when thor asks what are you talking about he says loki for once your timing is excellent lady sif saw my plight correct she's the one that basically took the place of heimdall after heimdall died and his response is no but then she's the guardian of the rainbow bridge not the babysitter of the odin son and he says i fear even the sharpness of the tongue cannot cut through this fog descending around me and so where loki surmises that thor is beginning to succumb to the odin sleep so it's only a matter of time before he basically just collapses due to sheer exhaustion the response of loki is thor you have to answer the question will you trust me and thor's a little hesitant here right he says like when the trickster asks for trust it often means trouble the response of loki is this is important thor you must answer and it must be the right answer will you trust me as a loyal subject of asgard the response of thor yes i trust your loyalty loki's next question will you trust me as your sibling who loves you the response of thor of course of course i do we are ken loki i brought you back from death because i missed you you will always have a place in my heart yes i trust you as my own blood the response of loki one more question thor he says this one is the most important on this the future rests will you trust me even as your enemy and thor becomes very hesitant here because one of the things that had happened with loki over the years and this is something to be aware of loki up until the events of siege on asgard at the end of the dark rain kind of branding initiative that marvel had when norman osborne and his ilk and so on tried to attack asgard and brock in oklahoma there's a whole history behind it we don't need to go into it loki effectively sacrificed his life when that happened he ended up returning right now when he came back he basically reformed his ways he came back as a good guy he wasn't fully trusted by the people around him but it was like a big status quo for his character i mean good guy is a loose term when it comes to loki so he was like less of a bad guy than he had traditionally been but what he's putting out here is i'm returning to my villainous ways but even in knowing that i'm going back to being the old villainous loki that i always was do you still trust me and the response of thor is yes loki even as my enemy i trust you so be what thou must be and do what thou must do now this all feeds into the nature of loki as like the god of stories because one of the things that marvel's kind of been alluding to is this notion that loki kind of has the ability to alter reality almost on this kind of universal scale by basically manipulating stories as they get told right kind of basically seeding exactly how things progress now i'm hypothesizing here there's no direct indication that's the case it's just kind of what i'm picking up on from what marvel's been talking about over the years but that's when loki takes on a totally new form that we've never seen before right loki the teller of tales a whole new personality a lot of old school fans were really irritated they wanted to see like the original loki come back like the horns coming out of his head and that kind of thing but such as it is whatever this form is that loki now has and whatever power it entails will become stupendously important to the future of the thor mythos but with that being said guys we're gonna bring this to an end thank you all for watching and i will catch you all later Peace.